Well, good morning. Come and take a seat. Uh, big welcome to you. If you're joining us on site uh, or online, uh, please say hello in the chat. It's um, great to be together this morning. If you haven't yet met, uh, my name's Sam, and uh, I've actually been uh, nearly in a few months' time, will have been living in Letchworth for 11 years. Can't believe uh, how that's gone by very quickly. Uh, since we moved with my wife and now we have three children and as of a week ago uh, a new puppy in the house so if I seem a bit tired this morning we have had a few a uh, few disturbed nights uh, but uh, it's a lot of fun uh, but maybe you've had a busy week as well I don't know what you've got going on at the moment but uh, I think it's just so great that we can have this time and space just to still ourselves and I pray that God will be speaking to you uh, as I share uh, this morning. As we carry on, uh, I'm picking up the second part in our new series called Investigating Jesus. Uh, we're looking at the, uh, the book of Luke. Um, and this is just a great collection of findings and research and all the, the documentary approach, uh, investigatory approach that Luke took to uh, capturing uh, first-hand eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. So I hope you'll continue to uh, join us as we journey through this. Uh, if you missed Joel's introduction where he opened the series last Sunday, then you can catch up with that on our YouTube channel, uh, along with all of our messages from Sundays, as I checked yesterday, going back up to three years now. So there's plenty to, uh, to keep you busy uh, looking back there. Uh, but if you missed out last week as well, we were giving out this special limited edition copy of just the book of Luke. Uh, really encourage you to pick one up if you haven't already. And just to be reading this in the week is a great way to uh, journey along and keep it as a companion as we go through uh, this series. And I hope you join us as we explore uh, some really, I think, important questions. Uh, how we know and why we follow. Now, I mean, maybe you're just here exploring, uh, carrying out your own sort of investigations, just peeking in from the edges. But maybe you've been a follower for many years. I think at some point in our lives, it's important to come back to why is it that we follow and how, do we, how can we be uh, sure of that? I have to say for me, uh, when I grew up um, in my household, uh, my, my close family were all followers of Jesus. I regularly was at church as a, as a youngster. And I have to say, I, I can't really pinpoint a particular moment in time when I feel like I made that choice to follow for myself. Uh, faith and knowing Jesus has really been a constant companion uh, through my life. But I wouldn't just put it down to my upbringing or uh, just down to uh, what I got comfortable with or convenient uh, with because as you'll discover uh, when you follow Jesus it's never uh, all that straightforward because life throws things up and we have to deal with things and as we continue to walk in our journey with following Jesus there's challenges that come to us about how we think how we act and how we behave and so there'll be many opportunities to turn and take a different path. Um, so I feel I've done my best to keep making those choices, even when it's been hard and challenging. And I'm sure some of us here will have stories from our life when we've been faced with those moments uh, when we could go one way, we could just do what we wanted to do, what might be more convenient or more comfortable. But following Jesus has caused us a certain level of discomfort it's we've had to pay some price some cost for doing that because when we're following Jesus it's not just our personal walk it's how we treat and love those around us and sometimes those around us uh, can cause a little friction in our lives sometimes we can cause friction to other people so I found it always to be a constant companion through the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs. Uh, when life has been bumpy, I could tell you many stories uh, when uh, we faced challenges um, and when I found both the presence of God with me and his people with me has continued to help me to journey on. 
and I'd like to think I'm trying my best to keep making that choice every day, every week. Doesn't mean we always get it totally right. Um, but I just want to encourage you that that is what it looks like as we outwork this living of being a follower of Jesus. That is a daily choice. It doesn't always go to plan, but we keep on coming back and keeping going. So let's get started with a question. Uh, if your life was an advert, uh, what would you be advertising? Maybe it's a bit of a thing you'd have to just get your head around. I mean, maybe you're a big sports fan, and so someone would say, well, you're always talking about sport, so enthusiastic about sport, maybe a particular team uh, that you, you, you follow closely and are raving about. Maybe you're a food connoisseur, and whether it's cooking or uh, trying at different restaurants, uh, you just love food and really into that. Maybe it's movies and uh, watching whole different kind of genres of film. Uh, people might just know that you're, you know, you always know what's coming out. You know who the different actors are, which director did this film at this time, uh, and maybe that's your thing. But I mean, perhaps you feel like you don't have loads to shout about about your life. Well, I don't know where you're at this morning, um, but you're welcome to join us. And we'll think about someone in a moment from the book of Luke who his life is all about advertising something. But this person wasn't promoting themselves. They weren't promoting an interest. They're actually advertising someone else. They were pointing us to follow someone else. So if you've got access to one of these books or access to a Bible right now, just encourage you to join us as we turn to Luke chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Tetrarch, Philip Tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene. I mean, what a, what, a, what a pretty interesting start to the story, to the book. I mean, you didn't realize that it was going to be an in-depth history lesson this morning. Well, don't worry, it'll get a bit more interesting than that. But what we remember here is that as Luke is carefully documenting and researching the life of Jesus, as he's been asked to do, he didn't know that his writings would be uh, translated into over a thousand different languages and read every day by billions of people across the world. He was just responding to his commission to go and do his own investigation and research into this person of Jesus. And so his writing it is history because he's writing down the facts and the context of the time. And these are things that we can verify. These are things that are recorded from other sources. And so that was Luke's commission to investigate and record. So when we talk about faith in Jesus, it's not just some ethereal belief, but there is real reason and logic that Luke is, is capturing for us in his book. And that's why we're taking these weeks to look into this into more detail. So let's not just dismiss uh, faith as some kind of weird religion that's trying to control us or get things out of us or force us to attend church services. Actually, Luke is much more looking into this, into who is the person of Jesus. And that's what we want to have our focus on, not about religious activity. So after this sort of historical uh, introduction, Luke takes a breath and here we meet the sort of character of the story we're going to be looking at this morning. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now you may have heard of John the Baptist. His uh, uh, characterized as quite a, a uh, interesting personality, uh, things he used to eat and wear. Um, but um, uh, this is just the beginnings of Luke's record about him. And he's known and documented as a, a real historical figure in first century Jewish history. Uh, the historian Josephus 
records the activities and life of John the Baptist because he caused such a stir at the time. He was not one who would uh, just sit and say nice things that people wanted to hear. He felt he'd been given an important message that he needed to declare, and it wasn't always the most popular message, as we will discover. So the account uh, continues. It says he went into all the country around the Jordan, that's the, the river, the River Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. See, John's role was to create a sense of expectation among the people for the coming Messiah. See, the, the Jewish people would have known, as it has been foretold in, in, in the ancient scriptures that they would have studied and understood, that one day somebody would come to revive their, their fortunes, to reestablish the nation of Israel, to overthrow their oppressors, which at the time would have been the Roman Empire, and to bring back uh, freedom from slavery and captivity. So as soon as somebody started to talk about, well, this sounds like a Messiah's coming, people, there would have been a great sense of interest from people at the time. And so they would have, John would have had somewhat of a platform to share what he was thinking. But the sort of person that John started to describe didn't always quite match up to everyone's idea of what that Savior and that Messiah would be. People perhaps didn't think that they needed any kind of personal salvation, that this would be a military or political leader who would uh, re-establish the greatness and deal with those on the outside but not deal with anything on the inside. But as we come to discover, Jesus was all about the other way around. And as John begins to explain and prepare people, he's not preparing them for some great political revolution, storming the gates and uh, taking uh, or re-establishing Israel by might. He's talking about a completely radically different approach to freedom, one that begins by change within each one of us and each one of the people who are listening to him at the time. He was saying something and someone new is coming and you don't want to miss it. Now if you've been around uh, New Life Church for any length of time, uh, you'll know that we've got such a great set of people who serve on all kinds of different teams. Uh, and maybe if you join us on site this morning, you've met a few of those on our, our new welcome team. Um, and if you wanted to be on, on the welcome team by which that would be fantastic. But, but, but the main goal of that is to make someone coming in uh, feel welcomed, uh, smile, make them feel settled, explain what's going on, uh, and just give them a warm welcome. Now, if we look back in our passage in Luke, um, I'm not sure we would have necessarily wanted John the Baptist to be on the welcome team because uh, he sees some visitors arriving and he, he, he whipped out this pretty fierce line. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? I mean, that's not much of a welcome. I would have thought if, uh, if that's how you were greeted this morning, you probably wouldn't still be hanging around. I mean, talking about uh, saying what you think. John clearly didn't have a problem uh, with speaking uh, his mind and what he felt that God was saying to him. Now. Uh, the group of people he, did, he was addressing here, uh, we've covered in, in recent weeks, these two religious groups uh, of the Jewish hierarchy, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he detected already that they were turning up, not because they really wanted to hear his message uh, and to receive it, but that they were either coming to check him out as to how they could uh, trip him up and catch him out with his theology. Or I'm sure there was also a nagging doubt in their mind that if they didn't sort of listen in to what was going on, that somehow they might miss out on obtaining some kind of, some kind of uh, blessing or, or attaining some kind of approval through what they felt they might need to do 
uh, if there's new leaders coming, that they wanted to be signed up, have all the certificates, uh, been through all the courses, done everything, because that was their approach to their relationship uh, with God, almost like a get out of jail free card, uh, trying to include them in the activities. But John immediately says that just simply showing up isn't enough. And he starts to explain that if you want to be right with God, then you need to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Now this might sound a bit of a confusing uh, or complicated uh, set of instructions. So perhaps you could think about it like this. It's your life that must change, not your skin. And so he sees these people turning up, they'll be dressed in their religious robes, they'll be keeping, making sure they're keeping away from anyone they'd feel it was unclean. Um, and he's saying, look, it's not about the exterior, it's not about being in the right place or seen to be doing the right things. That this new savior, this new kingdom that is coming is about a change on the inside and about how you live. See, John's message, and in fact our message here, is that following Jesus involves changes in your life. And sometimes those changes can be hard and sometimes painful. But it's about facing the truth and knowing that through the love that God has shown to us before we even knew him, that following Jesus is the best and only worthy response to that love. John encourages us and the people at the time to produce fruit. So what does that mean? Well, it means what's coming out of our lives, the way we live. Are the people around us blessed because of us? When you walk into a room, do people feel like the mood lifts or the mood drops? Are they excited and pleased that they're going to have a chance to see you. At New Life Church, we're passionate about believing and, and teaching that following Jesus is about changing the inside first. We're not about just making changes to the exterior, about how we appear or how we come across, just trying to be nice, comfortable people. We actually believe that following Jesus makes a change on the inside of us. And that is much more important than how we might appear. And then as that happens, the outside then follows because our actions, our thoughts, our words begin to be more like his. If we're only focused on the exterior, on our appearance, then we're just like those Pharisees and Sadducees. We're just, as John labels them, a, a, a collection of snakes that actually it's just all about it's all false, and it's all for some other motive. See, God wants to work on the inside of us. Now, if we look at the second part of that, John's talked about producing fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, again, repentance seem, might seem like a bit of a sort of word from the Dark Ages, uh, a bit of a, a kind of religious word, but if we look at the actual word in the Greek, which is where it came from, the word is metanoia, and it means a change of mind, a reorientation, a fundamental transformation of outlook. I mean, how much do we need that in our world today? If we look around and see all of the chaos and carnage, the the brutality, the evil that's present. How much do we need a change of mind, a reorientation of those things? But if we bring it closer to home, we think about across our town, where we live, in our neighborhoods. There's, there's times when it's clear that there is no peace. How much do we need a change of mind? a fundamental transformation of outlook across the homes around us. Maybe even in our own lives, we're bound up with things that we can't seem to escape from. Do we need a fundamental change in our outlook? 
See, repentance is about turning. It's about some kind of activity. Perhaps from our uh, religious descriptions of it in the past, it's just about saying sorry, but it's, a, it's an activity, it's an action. We have to turn away from that which is destructive and choose to walk in the opposite direction. That doesn't mean it's easy by any means. But God promises that he will equip us and support us as we do that with the help of his Holy Spirit which comes to live in us when we choose to follow him. The very Spirit of God will help us is described as the helper, one to help us walk in the right way. And equally helps us through being uh, embedded within a, a body, like being part of this church if you are. I'm sure you've been encouraged and blessed as you walk through things in your life with people alongside you to encourage you and support you. We could paraphrase John's words in this way perhaps. Produce fruit in keeping with what you say you believe and who you claim to believe in. That should be somewhat unsettling perhaps, somewhat disturbing. If I was to play back the videotape of my mind in the last week, am I keeping in with what I say I believe and who I claim to believe in? But John doesn't just leave us with that sort of prickly challenge uh, with no directions. In fact, three different groups of people come to John and say, well, what should we do? How do we, how do we approach God? How do we prepare ourselves for the coming Messiah? And Luke captures this. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors can be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Very practical responses to people's questions. Perhaps we could summarize it like this. Exhibit care for others and live gen generously. Don't cheat or steal. Tell the truth. Live with integrity. How would these three practices change your life if you embrace them ever more? Or perhaps we could just think of it like this. Do what's just, not what you can justify. And this is, I think, stark contrast to a religious way of living. I mean, religion looks like this. I messed up, so I better hide it from dad. But relationship would look like this. I messed up, I better call dad. Now I wonder how you feel in the day-to-day -day of your life when things don't go as you'd hope them to, as you make mistakes, as you feel you're battling things and aren't sure which way to go. You feel you want to hide away in shame because you fear perhaps God is going to tell you off, that he won't approve, that he'll be disappointed. Or do we feel that actually we have that relationship where well, no matter what's happened, whatever mess we found ourselves in, we can come to him. In fact, we need to come to him. That's how God the Father wants us to come. Not out of a religious duty to somehow seek his forgiveness, but to come in relationship as one would do to another. To say we're sorry for what's happened, but to know that we need rescuing and that we need to come to him. Do we need to be reminded or know that God the Father loves us so much that he'd happily always take your call, night or day, whatever mess you're in. 
And this, the teaching that John was bringing, it was so radical at the time because all of the, the Jewish religion, the way everyone had learned to approach God was all about performance and practice and observing and trying to do everything right and not make a single slip up or mistake. But John is turning us upside down. He's saying righteous living, what's going on in your hearts is of most importance, not the outward appearance and activities. And so people started to listen to John and they started to wondering, well, maybe this guy is the Messiah. I mean, he's talking some pretty radical stuff. But I imagine John just chuckling and thinking, I'm just the warm-up act here. I'm just the, I'm just the advert. I'm just pointing to the one who's coming. Because he says this, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. I mean, how did John gain this insight of just how transforming and how radical this new kingdom was going to be? Well, we don't know. We don't know. But we know that he caught something of the heart of God. And that was his role, to come and prepare people for the arrival of Jesus. The one who is going to change everything was coming. So what changes the world? Is it just belief in and of itself? Or maybe we need to ask the question, just as people did to John, what should we do? How should our lives look? We should take on board his wisdom. Does belief without action endure? Is that the sort of faith that we promote? Is just about, it's all about believing. We just want to convince you to believe? No. Those beliefs change how we live. And that's how the love of God is shown to one another. I don't want you to be more religious. I want you to have more relationship with God. One of the key differences is that a religious person may often ask, how can I appease God for all the mistakes that I've made? But I'd say the one pursuing relationship with God might ask this question, how can I please God? And one of the things that always pleases God is when we meet the needs of those around us. Just as the people were asking John, what should we do? He talked about how they behave towards other people. If we only admire the teachings of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the stories of Jesus, it does little to change our world. But if day by day we put into practice the actions of faith, loving others, meeting needs, right living, then it will change the world. It will bring about the radical new kingdom that John was pointing towards. So as we take the time to follow along with what Luke has captured for us, what he's been researching at the outset in these early chapters of his records, we already begin to see it's a very different type of kingdom that he's describing. Not one that people would have been expecting at the time. And so as you come towards Jesus, as you begin to explore faith, as you take some time to reflect on your faith journey so far, it won't always be how you expect it to be. But I hope you know that it's not about the observance and portraying a life that's all sorted. It's about relationship with him and about how we treat one another. I want to challenge us today that we pursue deep actions over deep teaching. There's nothing wrong with the deep teaching, but that needs to result 
in deep actions. Doing can be very deep and it deepens our faith and dependency on God as we step out, as we listen to the advice and the responses that John gives to those in the crowd asking him, what should we do? How we treat one another is going to be the deepest of those things. Don't just follow along with great teachers. Find some great doers. Find people who know how to put this into practice. Get alongside them. Great ways to do that here at New Life Church is being part of a fuse group, one of our midweek groups. We get to spend an evening or so together each week just hearing people's life journey, how they are working faith, how can we support and encourage one another and be inspired by seeing people putting this stuff into action. Those who walk the talk. You know, Jesus was one of those people, wasn't he? He didn't just give, give kind of inspiring speeches, but we, as we read both through Luke and the other Gospels, every step along his journey as he encountered people in need, he took the time to meet those needs. Doing those things requires us to wade in beyond our ability. It asks of us to go to the bottom and the depths where we meet people with their problems that we can't solve on our own. Moments when we need to bring in God's wisdom and his love. And doing is also messy and costly. I said earlier that following Jesus is costly. He never promised that it would all be roses and smiles. And if we're just hearers and consumers, that pathway will just lead us to be so consumed with ourself that our faith will eventually wither. It's only as we put it into practice, as we do for others, that we'll see it come alive. And John knew that if the people in his audience did compassion, if they acted selflessly and put others first, they would recognize God's work in the world and embrace the selfless others first, son of God. That would be the best advert for Jesus is how we live. So I encourage you this week to stop and to pray. Maybe you've never prayed before. We can pray, anyone can pray. God is desperate to hear and take any of our calls. I encourage you to think of this. Heavenly Father, what should I do? Let's think about these two things in this coming week. The first off is to breathe in grace. And the second would be to breathe out mercy. So what is grace? It's God's free gift. It's God's gift to us, freely given, of knowing him, of relationship with him. So we breathe in the grace of God. We acknowledge that it's not something that we've earned, not something that we could even earn. We acknowledge that knowing him is a gift which is given to us, cost him a great price. But it's not something we earn and it's not something that we can lose through our actions. God doesn't look at our behaviors in the week and decide whether or not we qualify. He already chose us to qualify. The only ask from him is that we respond to him so as we breathe in grace this week, we can have grace for ourselves, surely. That when we disappoint ourselves, let ourselves down, when we feel like we failed, we can still have grace because God has given his gift to us freely. And he wants 
to be in that relationship with us where we don't feel we have to hide things from him. Actually, our first port of call should be to run to him. It's the best thing that you can do. And then the second thing, breathing out mercy. That's going to extend that gift of grace to those around us. So let's take that courageous step this week. Let's find someone with a need that we can meet. Let's start to respond and realize that following Jesus is that response to meeting the needs of those around us. That belief is the beginning, but we work that out through our doing in how we live and how we think. And may you take this away to breathe in the grace of God and breathe out mercy for those around us. It's difficult to do the latter without the former. We need to find those moments to breathe in that grace, to hear the voice of Father God reminding us how much he loves us. And then we're able, we have that capacity to show love and mercy to those around us. Let's take a moment to pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you that we have the record of Luke, that he approached capturing this, and uh, capturing the life of Jesus in this way, and that we can read it back now and start to discover what you're what you're saying, what you were saying then, and what you say to us here and now. And I'm sorry if we've ever put out there that a religious life is the one we need to follow. Where we felt that we need to act and behave in a certain way to earn your love, or that we've already acted and behaved in certain ways that we think you could never love us. God, thank you for your free gift to us. We pay no cost for that because you paid it all through your son, Jesus. So would we breathe in your grace? Help us to live lives full of your grace, grace for ourselves. But then equally, as we do that, that we would show great mercy to those around us. Even when we're hurt or disappointed, let us show, extend that grace to those. And let us heed the advice of John as the people asked, well, what can we do to prepare? It's way more than just a belief. It's what we put into practice. How we care and love for those around us. So would you strengthen us to do that? And if we've never spoken to you before God, would we realize that you're the one we need to run to? when we're in need, not the one to hide from, that you want to embrace us with open arms, to lift us up, to know that being with you is the safest place we can be, is the best place that we can be. And will we continue to look out for the needs of others this coming week and see how we could meet those that our lives would be adverts for way more than just pastimes. But our lives would be adverts for you as people see how we breathe in your grace and breathe out your mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, if you've got children in their groups over the road please get them at 12 o'clock which leaves us a few minutes if you want to
stay around and grab another refreshment be great to uh, have a chance to catch up we'll be back again next sunday with the next uh, installment in our series but i hope you have a great week and uh, look forward to seeing you soon Thank you.